Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, opinions and trends from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by John Kapal of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association. John, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris, for inviting me. So talk to us for just a moment or two about how you got involved in the taxpayer protection business. Sure. Um, I am, am an, an attorney. Uh, I went to the uh, College of William & Mary, uh, got my law degree in 1982, and then had a two-year fellowship with a conservative public interest law firm called the Pacific Legal Foundation. Came out from uh, the East Coast in 1982, and uh, with the intention of staying here two years and then going back and practicing law in Washington, well, two years turned into 32, so uh, uh, we've been here a long time. Uh, I stayed with Pacific Legal Foundation for uh, nine years, specializing in, in environmental law, uh, political law, and t appellate work, and uh, started taking on some of these tax cases almost by accident. Uh, a guy by the name of Paul Gann walked in the door one day, and I was the junior lawyer, and so I took his case, and I won it. So the word got out that there was this lawyer who was uh, doing taxpayer advocacy law. And then the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association used me in a couple cases. And then, uh, and then they hired me away. And then I was their director of legal affairs for about nine years. And then I became president in the year 2000. So I've been at, been at taxpayer advocacy for uh, uh, all of my professional life. So you had the options of the Viper's Pit in Washington or the Viper's Pit in California, and you stuck with California. Uh, we did. The weather was very nice, and Sacramento is a very nice town to uh, raise a family, and uh, so we decided to stay out here. There's a lot of opportunities, which is very interesting, you know, for as much as we like to criticize California as extremely burdensome tax and regulatory environment, it is still a great place to live. and. Some of us are of the belief that it's very much worth fighting for, and we do believe that ultimately the principles of free markets, property rights, limited government uh, will will prevail in the end, and so we're going to stick it out. Well, we sure hope it does, uh, because that you're right. It's a beautiful place in the country. It's three miles from anything you'd want to, or three hours from anything that you'd possibly want to do. Uh, it's just that that tax climate and, and the regulatory climate, as you said, that make it just kind of unbearable at times. So one of the things that Howard Jarvis is best known for is the advocacy for Prop 13. And a lot of people hear about it and it causes a lot of emotion. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about what Prop 13 really is about and why it causes so much animosity between people who want to own property and people who want to have tax revenue. You know, Prop 13 remains the third rail of California politics, meaning that if politicians want to touch it, they're likely to get fried. Uh, that may not be true in all areas right now, but the fact of the matter is Prop 13 remains extraordinarily popular with the uh, voters of the state of California. We do benchmark polling every couple of years, and if it were on the ballot today, it would pass by about the same two-thirds margin that it did back in 1978. Why Proposition 13 passed in 1978? One word, fear. People were deathly afraid of losing their homes. Tens of thousands of people were being taxed out of their homes, and, uh, and it was becoming an intolerable situation. Prop 13 reduced property taxes by limiting the property tax rate from what was in California at the time about an average of 2.6%, reduced that rate to 1%, 1% rate cap, that remains the law today. And more importantly, Prop 13 limited the annual increases in taxable value of property to 2% a year, notwithstanding whatever happened with the real estate market. So you could be in a hot real estate market and your property could double in value in one year, and yet the taxable value against that 1% would apply uh, could only go up 2% a year. It is that provision that uh, is really uh, very important for California homeowners and quite frankly, very important for California businesses who own real estate. So uh, Prop 13 also imposed voter approval requirements 
uh, for additional taxes at the local level and also impose a very important state requirement, a requirement of a two-thirds vote of each house of the legislature in order to impose a state tax increase. So that is, in a nutshell, what, it's, what it did. Howard Jarvis, uh, and what was most interesting, Chris, about Prop 13 is the coalition that was aligned against it. Every single labor organization, all the business organizations, believe it or not, the Chamber of Commerce, all the banks, the railroads, everybody was opposed to it. Every single editorial board in the state of California, every institutional interest opposed Prop 13 and it passed by 66%. This was really the quintessential example of the disconnect between political elites and ordinary people. And uh, we sometimes see that today where, where uh, no matter what their political party, our political elites are very much out of touch with the concerns of ordinary taxpayers. So Prop 13, as I say, remains very popular today. We have had to go back to the voters on a number of occasions to close some of the loopholes that were created by the California legislature and by the courts. And we have closed that with initiatives that we sponsored uh, in 1982 and also in 1996 with Proposition 218. I won't get into the, into the technicalities, but again, okay. government is like an amoeba. If you, if you squeeze it, it pops out someplace else. <laughs> and so we have constantly tried to restrain government's ability to extract more tax dollars from California's beleaguered taxpayers. Well, I understand why the spendaholics in Sacramento would be against something like Prop 13 and limiting the amount of uh, money that could be extracted from someone's home. But talk to me about why the businesses were against it when that fight began. And uh, the unions kind of, uh, I can understand too, they don't want anything interfering with their due structure, uh, but, um, or, or their political power. But, but talk to me about the business community. Why were they against it? Well, it's very interesting. They thought it was too draconian. Uh, they bought into some of the uh, propaganda by a very important, well-known economists saying that California would plunge into a depression if Prop 13 uh, passed. Uh, all those predictions of Armageddon and the end of Western civilization, of course, did not come to pass. Once Prop 13 passed, California enjoyed some of the most robust economic growth and of course that generated tons of additional tax revenue. Uh, the business community of course now has come around. We have a uh, fairly strong alliance with the business community and quite frankly Prop 13 today is one of the few things that keeps California businesses here. Many businesses have left. We know that Campbell Soup has left, Waste Connection, major corporations, Tesla, Toyota. Uh, we see across all demographics people moving out of California to escape the hostile tax and regulatory climate. But Prop 13 today, the business community has obviously come around to our side and we are partners with them in trying to preserve it. Uh, one of the biggest threats to Prop 13 is the so-called split role, which would split the tax role between residential and commercial uh, property. And although our members are almost exclusively residential homeowners, we see the value in extending, as intended, the protections of Proposition 13 to the business community because we know they're, they're as beleaguered as ordinary citizen taxpayers. And uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, we either hang together or we hang separately. So uh, we're hanging together with the business community trying to preserve Prop 13 and quite frankly, trying to enhance the business and economic growth of the state of California. Well, for the businesses today, I mean, there are so many other strikes against them that that is one piece of uh, of a security blanket for them and a piece of predictability. You never can tell what Sacramento is going to come up with next to uh, make it more difficult for them to do business. Uh, so right now, you, we, we were talking a little bit about uh, before the show that the hot topic in Sacramento right now is budgeting. Um, talk to me a little bit about how the the association helps in those conversations about Sacramento budgeting? Well, first of all, everything you hear in the media is probably false about the state budget. Everybody says we've, we've suffered draconian cuts during the recession. The reality is there were only real cuts in one year of the, uh, of the four or five year recession. In fact, state spending grew 
thirty percent in the last five years. So when they, you, you know as well as I do, Chris, that when the government talks about cuts, they're talking about reductions in what they anticipated they would get. They still get more money for their programs, uh, but their definition of cuts is certainly not what California families or California businesses mean when they have their budgets cut. Uh, so California, you know, the growth industry in California uh, is not high tech, uh, is not biotech. The growth industry in California is government. Uh, government spending at the state and local level has far outstripped population and inflation and continues to do so. And what we try to do is we try to inject a little bit of realism uh, and remind people how government has grown in California. And to his credit, Governor Brown is trying to tamp expectations uh, from others in his political party. It's, it's very funny, Chris, you know, if this were Texas, people would look at Governor Brown and say he's the most liberal guy in the, in the world. We live in a universe known as California where Jerry Brown is actually the adult in the room as far as Democrats go because he has successfully tamped down or at least trying to tamp down some of the expectations of the tax and spend lobby that just want to spend money willy-nilly. He actually understands that we have billions of dollars in unfunded liabilities in our pension funds and also our retiree health care obligations. So uh, I, we, uh, when he does the right thing, we call him out and uh, pat him on the back. And when he does something we don't like, like high-speed rail, which is the biggest boondog in the world, we criticize that very voraciously. So um, we're a policy shop. We're nonpartisan. And uh, we will go after e uh, Democrats or Republicans equally uh, if, they, uh, if they support bad policies, bad policies for economic freedom. And so you just brought up two topics, one being that California has a universe. It's a parallel universe to other places uh, <laughs> in the world. But you brought up the, the high-speed rail, which kind of bridges to another topic. Uh, you do actually get involved still, even though you're no longer with PLF, uh, in lawsuits and things, such as the high-speed rail and some of the changes that have happened. Because we know that the politicians want as much money as possible, but we also know that as soon as they get the money allocated, they don't necessarily stay on task and on topic and try to deliver what they proposed in the first place with the legislation. Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing on the high-speed high speed rail front. Well, first of all, you're right about the litigation. Uh, you know, when I became president of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, the first thing I did is hire another uh, Pacific Legal Foundation trained attorney to, to take my place as director of legal affairs. We're probably the only um, statewide taxpayer group, maybe the only taxpayer group, period, in the United States that has a full-time litigation capacity. I don't think that any taxpayer group or any conservative uh, advocacy group can do anything unless it has the ability to go into the courtroom and fight for its principles. We also have a full-time lobbyist and we have a full-time education effort, but having the ability to sue government is so important if your adversary usually is government. Uh, we have, we, have uh, uh, we had a lawsuit against the high-speed rail that was resolved unfavorably to us. However, we're still participating in other high-speed rail litigation, and we are continuing to point out that everything that the voters were promised as it relates to high-speed rail was a lie uh, when they originally voted for it in, in 2000. The ridership, the speed, how it was going to be paid for. This has morphed into a 30 from from a, a 30 to 38 billion dollar project into a 68 billion dollar project. And quite frankly, we partnered with the Reason Foundation, and we believe that the uh, ultimate cost could be well north of 200 billion dollars. Uh, so uh, we continue to be a thorn in the side of the high speed rail uh, project uh, be, uh, in the courtroom, but also just in the in the courtroom of public opinion, this is a project that is not ready for prime time. All the problems you saw with the Bay Bridge in your area and also with the Twin Tunnels, California just does not have the capacity to do these mega projects on time and under budget. So uh, we are very concerned that the high speed rail project will, will absolutely burn through tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of valuable transportation dollars that could be spent on better projects. So that's one of our higher high priorities. And quite frankly, 
we have a lot of people on the left side of the political spectrum who agree with us on this issue as well. Yeah, I know that there there are several. I have uh, people that I've been collaborating with, even that are progressive environmentalists who are against high speed rail for a, a number of factor or a number of reasons as well. And so, uh, keep up the fight on that one. Are there other fights that you're involved in right now that the audience might want to be aware of, or things that you see on the horizon that they may want to become more actively involved and educate themselves and their neighbors about? Uh, sure. If anybody owns uh, rural property, there is a uh, a tax, an illegal tax that was not approved by a two-thirds vote of each house. We've got uh, that's known as the Cal Fire tax, and it hits about 800,000 parcels throughout California. We're in the midst of litigation on that. And one of our recent successes was to bounce Proposition 49 off the ballot. This was an advisory measure uh, seeking to undermine the Citizens United case. Uh, via an advisory initiative. We said this was an inappropriate use of the initiative process, and we had the uh, we had the Court of Appeal, actually we had the California Supreme Court in an injunction take it off the ballot, so it did not appear on the November ballot. Now the full briefing on the merits is still ongoing, but that's gonna be a very interesting case. Uh, we, involving the legislature's attempt to manipulate the ballot process uh, to the benefit of the left side of the political spectrum. We have won a number of lawsuits involving the integrity of the ballot process. You know, when the legislature tries to manipulate a title or summary or, or puts in false and misleading language in, in some of its proposals. So we believe, you know, again, whether you're on the left or right, uh, the integrity of the ballot is something that's very, very important to us. Um, and uh, we also defend the initiative process, the process of direct democracy, because quite frankly, uh, the special interests have a lock on the legislative process and the initiative process, as Hiram Johnson uh, realized 100 years ago, uh, that uh, this was really the only tool that taxpayers and ordinary citizens had to break the lock of special interests in Sacramento. Okay. And so um, one of the things that uh, when you and I met, you actually will give um, at least recommendations for where to go for information if there are other taxpayer organizations or folks looking for this kind of information. Uh, the resources that you provide both on the site and through your team are pretty valuable to those kinds of activists. Can you tell us a little bit about the types of things that you help with on those fronts? Sure. I mean, a, a perfect example was today we had a new taxpayer group uh, being formed in the Central Coast. They had their first meeting. About 20 people showed up, some business people, some ordinary taxpayers. And we, we sometimes guide them through the process. I mean, there's a lot of technicalities involved in that. You know, how do we form a taxpayer group? You know, do we form as a 501c3 or do we form as a 501c4? We that process. We help them triage the issues that they might face, whether it's local school bonds, uh, we, we, we try to steer them away from things that uh, uh, that we think the taxpayer group shouldn't get involved in. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm conservative on most issues, but I think taxpayer groups should not intrude themselves into social issues, however, wherever you lay on that uh, particular spectrum. But I think for taxpayer groups, focusing in on the things that really are important to everybody, efficiency in government, Transparency is a big thing right now. Efficient use of taxpayer dollars and limited and uh, limited taxation are things that I think, even though California is known as a very progressive state, we see that young people today, for example, are very, very motivated about transparency issues. And so these are the kinds of things that we try to tap into. And the other thing, Chris, is our credibility is such, we, won, we win far more than half of the lawsuits that we bring. What has happened because of that is sometimes a local government will contact us and ask for our, our advice on some of the initiatives, like if we do this, will you guys sue us? And, <laughs> and uh, we, we sometimes actually help local governments through the process of engaging their local voters in how to ask for a tax increase or, or whether, they, whether it's an issue involving the Brown Act or the open meetings. And so we are more than willing to be a resource to anybody, whether it's government, whether it's people on the left side of the political spectrum. If they're interested in our perspective and, and need some technical assistance, 
on fiscal issues or or uh, freedom of information, those kinds of things, we are more than to uh, to provide that to anybody. Excellent. Well, that leads me into another question. Since you do have the reach way beyond Sacramento and across the state and probably also into other parts of the country on occasion, where are you seeing the trends as far as either local municipal governments, federal or state level uh, governments that are running afoul or that the citizenry believes that those entities might be running afoul of the, of the law? Well, uh, there, are, there are a myriad of issues where government can be violating the law. The, the, the big issue that, that I think is coming up right now, both at the state level uh, and at the local level, is the transparency as it relates to unfunded pension obligations. One of the things that we're trying to convince voters at either at the state or local level is that when any level of government asks for a tax increase, and they say it's for schools, they say it's for roads, it's not. It's to pay pension obligations. All the, for example, the Prop 30 tax hikes that were in the billions of dollars are going to address some of the unfunded uh, liabilities, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but voters ought to know that when government is asking for tax increases, they should know that it's going to pay down some of these extraordinarily generous, one-of-a-kind, gold-plated Cadillac pensions and compensation packages of their local officials and bureaucrats. And uh, I think people are just now waking up to that. We just saw something today where some manager in the Bay Area has accumulated vacation time worth $400,000. So when he retires, he'll get a check for that amount of money. That's just obscene. No other state allows that. Private sector doesn't allow that. These are the kinds of issues that we advocate that local local taxpayer groups and local business groups start start peeling away the layers of the onion to figure out what's actually going on with their tax dollars. Right. And are you seeing a trend toward with the bankruptcies in places like Vallejo and Stockton and other places? Are you seeing uh, that the local municipalities specifically are starting to get their act together and negotiate better deals for the taxpayers? Or are you uh, seeing that a lot of times the lessons haven't been learned yet? Uh, it's very much hit or miss. Okay. Uh, some local governments are getting it. I just found out today that the uh, uh, Sacramento Metro Fire just negotiated unbelievably huge increases in their compensation packages, which were already high to begin with, and that was done in a backroom deal. One of the things that the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association has done successfully is we have represented pension reform organizations and individuals in getting transparency uh, under the um, Public Records Act. We have established some case law through our litigation that this information is in fact public and they can't hide it. They've said, well, we can't release personnel information. The courts have agreed with us that not only do we get that information in the aggregate, but we're entitled to know, to know the name of the employee, how much they make, and what their compensation package is. So now those databases are now out there. The, the state controller, of the former state controller, now our treasurer, John Chung, has a great database. There are many other databases that are now being created that people can now go online and say, gee, I wonder what a police captain makes in LA, or I wonder what a, uh, a teacher in this school district makes, or a principal or somebody else in the administration. And sometimes they're shocked at, uh, at seeing what they see. Okay, well, we appreciate your wealth of knowledge and we appreciate you joining us on the show tonight. Can you just tell us the website where people can find out more information about the association and the resources you provide? Sure, our website is it's full of great information on taxpayer advocacy, and it's very simple. It's hjta.org, and people can also join online if they, if they want to, but there's a whole section there on taxpayer action tools. If you have any questions, just go ahead and drop us an email. Perfect. We appreciate it, John. We appreciate you joining us. If you'll hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum.
The conservative forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. Okay. <laughs> I don't accept anything less. <laughs> and welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. We appreciate their support tremendously. They make the show possible, but what they're best known for is their speaker series. And for example, this evening, they will be hearing from Bill Whittle uh, of Afterburner and, um, and uh, Firewall and Trifecta fame. He's nationally known as a speaker and commentator on the conservative side. In February, David Barton of Wall Builders will be joining us here in Mountain View. On March 10th, Dina, D Dennis Michael Lynch from They Come to America, he's the producer of that. In April, on the 14th, John Miller from Hillsdale will be doing a joint event. And on May 12th, Alan West will be joining us to share his perspectives on things, and I'm sure that will be a packed house. If you would like more information, you can come join us at 7 p.m. on the second Tuesday of the month at 432 Steerland Road here in Mountain View, or visit the website at theconservativeforum.com. The event starts at 7 o'clock. We appreciate you joining us this evening. Tax are something that is not necessarily always a super exciting topic to discuss, but it has a direct ramification on our livability and affordability of living here in California. So uh, that's where things start to get emotional and heated, even for a relatively dry topic. And the work that Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association does is important, and I invite you to look more at what they're doing there uh, to find out how these taxes are affecting you. On that note, I'd like to say thanks again for joining us this evening. This has been The Right Side. I've been your host, Chris Pareja. We look forward to seeing you on the show or in person sometime soon. And if you just can't wait, reach out to us at therightsidetv at gmail.com. Have a great night.